The thing I want to pose, though, is this problem, this question mm. that I think is a false problem, but I want you to show why. We have consecration of the Blessed Virgin Mary. You know, in dysfunctional families, I go to my mother, yeah. not to my dad, or I go to my dad and not <laughs> right. to my mother. Right. So why is this not a competitive sort of tug of war, a trade-off? Well, you have Mary, I have Joseph. Right, right. And that is a great question because I'm getting asked that a lot. Sure. And it's good that it's being asked. It means people are thinking and they're trying to figure it out because a lot of people, they, they um, the intention is great because they say, look, I, I love our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and I've given myself to Mary to be closer to him. And I'm always like, fantastic, because you got, you're right on. It's all about Jesus, and Mary uh, leads us to him. But I, I come back and I say to them two things. You know, we've got the example of Jesus himself. In the Gospel of Luke, it says that after that episode where he's lost in the temple, right, um, he wasn't actually lost, but, you know, <laughs> but, but they found him. And um, it says that he went back with them and was obedient to them, and he grew in wisdom and stature before God and man, right? Um now, the key there is that he did that under the watchful care of Mary and Joseph. And that's what I like to tell people is um, you're not members of a one-parent spiritual family. Right. Jesus wasn't either. So Mary is his biological mother, yes. Joseph was not his biological father. But nonetheless, he was the son of Mary and Joseph. He entrusted himself to their care. Well, we are the brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. And he is offering to us a gift um, today. Right, we we've known about Mary and consecration for a very long time. It's a gift, really, from the cross, really. And but now, because of this crisis in the world with families and the fatherhood, the patricide, right, mm -hmm. that's going on, I think the Holy Spirit and our Lord is is inviting us to realize that we've kind of been missing on some level. We've always loved Saint Joseph, right, the Church and saints, but now for this time, He's inviting us into something you know that kind of closes the gap so to speak. And it's because we're invited into this family, which I know you love, the covenant language and all that stuff. That's your stuff, right? So now we're talking about um, inviting in our spiritual father in a way that saints in ages past would have loved to have some kind of formula like this available to do. Because we, you know, as children, uh, 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 or as brothers and sisters of Jesus, we have to be able to call Mary and Joseph our spiritual parents as well. That's so right. it's not a competition, right? right? But you want to pay attention to both of them. Now, Mary is greater. She's the Immaculate. She's the Theotokos, the God-bearer, right? Of course, without a doubt. That's why it's not um, a competition. Right. But it's simply inviting in the Father that we need very much right now. And, um, and, and, and I think the timing has been perfect for it. I do too. Boy, what a wondrous grace. You think about the relationship between Jesus on the one side and Mary and Joseph on the other. And you mentioned the Gospel of Luke and the finding of the boy Jesus in the temple. It's significant that the Blessed Virgin Mary asks Jesus, why did you put your father and me right. through this? You That's know, right. It seems a little impertinent, but she knows that she can be honest with her son. She can be honest with God. Yeah. But at the same time, she doesn't say, why did you put your foster father? That's your right. legal father, <laughs> your father figure, you know, right. they really are a family, the holy family, the first and only holy family <laughs> thus far on earth in human history. And what St. Saint Francis de Sales refer to as the earthly trinity. Yes. And I mean, he is a saint and for good reason. He wasn't teaching heresy when he <laughs> taught that. It is an extension of the inner life of this divine family, yeah. the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit. But you know, when you think about family, you, you, you think about how there are certain settings in which it's fine to compete. But family is really where you collaborate, yeah. where interests converge. And there's a complementarity not only between male and female, but with parents and children as well. You know, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. Mm. And so it isn't like Jesus says, all eyes on me and only me, not Mary, right. much less Joseph. Right. No, he's bringing us to the Father who is an, a father from all eternity. And so you and I both love philosophy also. <laughs> St. Thomas Aquinas, yep, yep. you know, act potency, the 24 Thomistic Theses, essay yep. essence, all right. of that. Yep. But I do think that God has privileged the poor by making available an ontology, a metaphysic, an epistemology, a mm -hmm. way of knowing and being and living that is universally accessible. It's called yep. the family. Yes. And it's yes. not just biological or sociological. We discover in our faith 
that it really is eternal mm -hmm. and truer of God than it is for us and truer of the Holy Family than it is for any other household. Yep. And so things look kind of backwards when you call God Father until you realize, no, we're the ones who look look at things <laughs> backwards too. Yeah. And I, I find that this is really helpful for, for setting our vision aright. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I think it, it is. I mean, we, we hear and we say and we know that the family is the, the building block of civilization, right? right. And, and when that collapses, everything else falls apart. Well, it's so pivotal to realize that like uh, in Galatians chapter 4, when St. Paul says that in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. Uh, but the key thing is, is it's implied that woman was Our Lady, of course. Right. It's a no-brainer there. But she was married. The fullness of time was when that woman was married to St. Joseph. And that's why oftentimes you hear people say that Mary was an unwed woman when the angel came to her. This is not true. Right. She was already espoused to Joseph. There were two phases to the Jewish wedding at that time. Uh, the first phase was the betrothal. Which was more than engagement. That's right. Much. It was more than engagement. Yeah. That's very important. And then the second phase was when they moved into, they lived together, right? right? So, yes. Okay, so when the angel came to her, they were not living together at that time, but they were already married. And so that's significant because God waited. Just like, you know, he, he prepared Our Lady in her Immaculate Conception. And we say about that beautiful mystery that it's the dawn announcing the coming of the sun. So when you, mm. when you see those streaks on the horizon of the Immaculata, you know the sun's coming. But here's the key thing, too, is that before the incarnation of our Lord and Savior, before the gift of the Immaculate Conception was given to the world, God prepared a man for a mission and graced him with the graces necessary, though not an Immaculate Conception himself. Right. Joseph actually comes before Mary and Jesus. We're talking about something that has really not un been unpacked theologically this great uh, gift that God has given to us in Joseph. The interesting thing is that Pope Francis, in his latest apostolic letter, uh, which is wonderful, Patris Corde, with a father's heart, he calls St. Joseph a miracle, right? He's not the Immaculate. Right. He doesn't have that gift, no. But it's a miracle. There's something there. We need to unpack this, my friend. Right. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. And he didn't just give to Joseph, you know, the provisions to get through life with Mary and Jesus, just as he endowed her with a fullness of grace that was fitting her calling to be the mother of God. Yeah. So we have yet to explore and discover the graces of, 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 of spiritual fatherhood that again, are not metaphorical, yeah. but those graces that fitted him yeah. to be fully and truly a father to the son of God, the son of Mary, and the son of Joseph. Yeah, and to us. That's right. Right. Especially. And to yeah. us. And that's amazing because that's where, I mean, you probably need to write a book on this, is um, the typology stuff applying to Joseph from the Old Testament, right? right? I mean, in a certain sense, he is a new Abraham. His children will be more numerous than the stars of the heavens. Um, and even on some level, though we have to be careful, of course, with this this one, he is a new Adam. Not, right. th not the new Adam, but he is a new Adam. Uh, because as our original, you know, parents were uh, husband and wife, well... Yeah, if uh, Mary's the new Eve, yeah, do the math. Exactly. There really is a sense in which Jesus is obviously a new Adam too. Right, right. But in as much as Joseph is the father, mm -hmm. there really is an Adamic vocation to recover what was lost by our first parents who yeah. were also the first married couple. No, I, yeah. I don't think that this is competitive either. Right, you know, right. you can see how certain things apply to Jesus and Mary and the church, and it's not mutually exclusive. Yeah. You know, personally, my two favorites are the Davidic typology, mm -hmm. because that's how the angel addresses Joseph in Matthew 1, yeah. Joseph, son of David, even though his father's name is actually Jacob, but he's talking about the royal lineage right. and the fact that he stands as heir to the covenant oath that God gave to David regarding his son, that I will be his father and he will be my son and his throne will be everlasting, mm. et cetera. But, you know, as Pope Leo XIII point out, points out, and you also point this out, you know, in the Old Testament, there is a man named Joseph, mm. just like the new starts off that mm -hmm. way. And likewise, he is the son of Jacob, later known as Israel, just as Joseph is the son of Jacob. He's described as a just man, yep. just as St. Joseph is. He's also given dreams, just like St. Joseph. He also takes the Holy Family of Israel down to Egypt 
for provision and safety, just like St. Joseph does. He is misperceived as being unchaste in Genesis, just as the neighbors might have misperceived <laughs> Joseph. You could go on and on, but yeah. ultimately there in Genesis 41, 55, the Pharaoh himself says, Ite ad Joseph, go to Joseph. Yeah. He'll, he'll provide you with the bread and all of that. Yeah. And, and that becomes the signal call. And, you know, I think it's just so significant that, you know, all of these elements are more than coincidences. These show us just we're scratching the surface, as you yeah. know. Mm-hmm. Joseph typology is, you know, uh, it's a door that has been barely opened. Right. That's and right. It beckons. It does. It does. And, and I think there's probably hidden gems throughout the centuries that maybe haven't been translated by some obscure priest that was in Germany or somewhere that we're going to probably dig up at some point. But this is a field where you want to talk about people doing future doctorates. Right. This is f- phenomenal territory right now. <laughs> It, it sure is. Boy, I'm glad you said that because I don't necessarily want more and more academics, but I want more and more study, prayerful scholarship yeah. that will really fructify the church. You know, you also point out that it is late in coming in church history, mm-hmm. that you see Bernard of Clairvaux in the 12th century. Yeah. You say St. Bernardine of Siena as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, St. Therese of, of Avila, in a certain sense, popularizes this, right. along with St. Francis de Sales. Who are some other notables that you have seen? There's some big ones. One of yeah. my favorites um, is St. Lawrence of Brindisi. Oh, oh, wow. Doctor of the Church. His yes. stuff on St. Joseph is phenomenal. Um, and hardly anybody knows about it. Right. I mean, the one book that I found was published in India by a press that you know nobody over here is really aware of. And I'm, I was reading this, and I'm like, holy moly, this is incredible stuff, right? right? Um, but then you've got you've got others. Um, you've got Saint Peter Julian Yamard. I think oh, you might have yes. mentioned him. He is tremendous. Uh, Blessed William Joseph Chaminade. Oh yes, he's one of the most quoted in the. Oh, book, I know actually. he probably is. Yeah, I was and, really surprised to see the depth of his insights. Right, and he lived at a difficult time during the French Revolution, so he was kind of on the run from the authorities. And the only reason I discovered him was um, when I got my licentiate. Um, I was doing a lot of research, living in stacks, right? Just going through books, you know. And um, I discovered some of his stuff, and, I, and, and it wasn't even published. It was just in manuscripts that were just thrown into a, basically a binder. Wow. And I'm like, what is this? So I looked at some of his homilies on St. Joseph that he was giving as he was on the run from the authorities in France during the Re- French Revolution. Blew me away. I was like, this is unbelievable stuff. And yet almost nobody knows about it. So those are some of the figures. But we've also got, outside of the... The, the pastoral aspect or the academic aspect, you've also got the um, Apparition. devo- yeah, apparitions, right? right? You've got that. And people are often surprised when they hear this, right? Yeah. Our Lady of Knock. It Knock wasn't just Ireland, Our Lady. Yeah. It was, oh, it's my favorite. <laughs> yeah, Fatima. There was, were no words, and so it was uh, easy to approve. Classic St. Joseph, right? <laughs> right. Um, Fatima uh, mm. as well. You know, he's there blessing the world with the Christ child in his arms. But then you've also got that aspect of the, uh, I guess you could call it maybe the, the devotional. So... You've got um, St. Andre Bassett, mm-hmm. right? And you've got um, Blessed Petra of St. Joseph, which almost nobody knows about in Spain. She is mm-hmm. phenomenal. You've got St. Jose Manionet, another priest in Spain who is just off the charts in his devotion, founded a shrine to St. Joseph. Um, they know about it in Spain, but we don't know about it over here. Um, and this is where we've got to get the ball rolling on this. I mean, like you said, Spain has this great love for St. Joseph. And it's fascinating to me that it wasn't until, I think, 1950, I think it was, that the first um, Estudios Josefinos, the first theological journal on St. Joseph, went into circulation. 1950s. It's amazing. <laughs> We're late in the game here. Well, what happened 150 years ago that Pope Francis is pointing to and commemorating and advancing? Yeah. So um, in 1870, uh, a great pope, blessed Pope Pius IX, um, who declared you know, the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, so many other wonderful things. Um, he was being petitioned by a lot of people to declare St. Joseph the patron of the Universal Church. Mm-hmm. Well, there was a Dominican, um, a blessed now, his name escapes me at the moment, but it's in the book. Um, he offered his life, basically said, look, I will sacrifice myself you know, in a major way to see this through. The Pope was really impressed by that. And um, sure enough, on December 8th, um, and that's a, see, that's significant too, because see, it's not a competition. Right. St. Mary's I guarantee you she's so happy that it was on her day that her husband was proclaimed the patron of the Universal Church. She wasn't right. jealous, you know. So um, so he did that phenomenal gift to the church, making him the patron of the church. And it was uh, nine years later that St. Joseph came to knock. 
and Our Lady and, and, and Our Lord depicted as a lamb and St. John the Evangelist. You know? Right. 